see the pictures on Echo 360? You see the link in Blackboard where it has the video? Which I have. Yeah, if you log into Blackboard, there is go down the menu on the left. There is a link called Class Web. That's where you can get the full access to the slides and the video of the lectures. So let's get started. If you need copy of syllabus or that ethics statement, I can share some extra help. So today we'll look at some basics of the, the industry, silicon, silicon fabrics in industry, and some basics of semiconductor materials. What are those materials? How do we make them electrically responsive? And where do we use them? something like this. If you click on this guy, it gets you to the course. You have all these things. You have lecture slides. You should have a spo that poster. All the way down, this is what calls class web recording. Oh, nice. you click this guy. Uh, don't alert me. And you see this lecture one. So this is something just going on right now. So if you do launch echo, it takes you to the, this guy. Where you can do whatever it's going to play did last time. So this, is, so this is essentially capturing the podium and lectures. Right? Very Let's uh, put it into a loop. Let's get out of this guy. So <coughs> you got it? E learn dot uta dot edu takes you to blackboard site right? then it takes you to, to so technically we could watch this live technically what we could watch this live yeah you watch this slide and you can watch probably this part of the podium also this guy is coming down 
All right, so this is reading assignment for next week, chapter 3, which is focused on thermal oxidation of silica. And, and as we discussed last time, oxidation of silica is, is the, the most, probably the fundamental feature that has made silicon the, the substrate of choice for semiconductor devices. And, and part of the reason was that it's grown easily and it can have, it has very different properties than silica. So essentially we can use it as an insulating material. We use it more importantly for the gate oxide, which is insulator used between the, the channel of transistor and the electrode of the gate. I'll go through a little bit more on the, on the transistor today because I gather not all are on the same page on what is. We know resistor, we know capacitor, but transistor is a slightly more involved. And we need to know at least the component before we start talking how do we make it. So the oxide is what has the it is done using a furnace where we control the temperature and where we control the, the content of oxygen. So we can bubble oxygen through water and do a process what we call wet oxidation or we just supply oxygen with nitrogen. Right? So that's again what is that process? Fundamentally where do we see that process happening? oxidation when we see rust right so but in this case we are using it to change silicon into silicon dioxide and we want to change it to achieve very controlled layer of silicon dioxide now think about it if i have silicon which is electrically active and of course after doping and i put silicon dioxide now how do we approach silicon then through silicon dioxide? H. H. What is H? H is you take off something chemically. So removal of certain material, right? But so it's it's like I have a whole surface which is covered of silicon dioxide and I have silicon beneath. So of course, there will be silicon dioxide from uh, on both sides. So I have to remove silicon dioxide from precisely known places. So I can approach silicon below that. If I need to make electrical connection, how would I approach silicon? So say I make an opening by what was said etching. Now I need to approach the silicon, how do I do that? Can you use photolithography? Use metal and then, of course, photolithography is something which I will do to define this pattern also before I edge. So the position, right? So we'll deposit some metal, right? So we'll deposit metal which will go everywhere. And then I will do another lithography, another, make a design again on the surface and I will remove metal from everywhere, and this will give me a contact with silicon. I've skipped many parts, many steps in between, but we'll see how. But is a general idea that why do we want to do oxidation? And what, how, how do we use silicon dioxide? So we use silicon dioxide. Now, when I say H, H requires two things, selectivity and sensitivity. What does that mean? So many times we, we we buy jewelry, right? So even men buy jewelry for somebody maybe. So a lot of jewelry has gold coated on it, right? What do they call it? It's a electroplate. Electroplating. So there is a layer of gold on top of maybe silver, right? So there is a coating of a different material on top. Why do we put gold on 
other materials. What is good about gold? Why number? Okay, let's think. Why gold is expensive? It's pretty. It's pretty. Okay. No, it, it, it doesn't oxidize easily. It's a noble material. It's a noble metal, right? What is a noble metal? Yes. This is high school chemistry. What is a noble metal? It doesn't react. Doesn't react, right? So it doesn't get degraded. It can stay. Whatever gram we buy, for years it will stay that same gram. It wouldn't get corroded. Even if you do the dishes, it doesn't react. So it's a noble metal. So we coat that thing with a noble metal, which basically safeguards whatever is below. Same is the reason we want to do silicon dioxide. Number one was electrically, we want to have a material which is insulating. Other is we want to put a protective layer on top, which doesn't result into further oxidation of silica. So uh, it's a passivation layer. It's like painting a, a metal thing with a paint, which doesn't let corrosion happen, which doesn't let rust happen. So it's a ox oxide is done to isolate, electrically isolate part, and to passivate the substrate to cover everything so no more reaction occurs with anything else. And why we are worried? Because we have to expose this wafer, this chip to subsequent reactions to do some different things, to deposit metal, to remove metal. To, so we have to have something. Same is achievable with silicon nitride by putting a nitride layer by depositing a nitrate layer. So, I just said depositing a nitrate layer. You would seldom hear growing a nitrate layer. Why is that? So we discussed this growth versus deposition last time. We can grow or deposit silicon dioxide, but we can only deposit silicon nitrate. What does that mean? What does that we are adding silicon So, so we can do some chemical reaction and convert silicon into silicon dioxide, but we cannot do a reaction, easy or straightforward reaction to convert silicon into silicon nitride. So what we do essentially, we always deposit silicon nitride. So silicon nitride again serves the same purpose, it's insulator and it has, insulator means it's electrically different and it can have passivation effect means it covers everything that's below and doesn't let further reactions. Now why is it difficult to grow? What? Why is silicon nitride difficult? It's relatively easy to grow silicon nitride. So yeah, the, this is an interesting question. Why don't we do so grow silicon nitride? Silicon nitride then silicon nitride. As a chip manufacturer and we'll see who are those. I want to save money. I want to have a process which is fast, rapid, because that saves me the cost per die. And it's not that we couldn't, we just don't want to. We, yeah, so we have a, a, something which serves the purpose. Why do we want to do that with something else? Uh, I have a question. Uh, how can I make sure that my silicon uh, dioxide layer is uniform? Uniform. <coughs> we will look at that. Once we, once you read the chapter, once we get through this oxide part, <coughs> we'll do all that. How do we ensure that? And it's a it's one of the fundamental requirements: uniformity of thickness of any layer that you put, not or grow, not just silicon. Like that. All right. So this is something from 1957. Essentially, till today, we are using the same principle on many places same apparatus. We have furnace, which is made of quartz. The quartz is, what is quartz? Sand. Sand? It has a big crystal. Big crystal and it's glass. Essentially it's glass, right? So it can withstand high temperature. And we load wafers in the furnace, we 
this, uh, these are heating coils. If we pump in oxygen, which may be with water vapor, or maybe just with, just with nitrogen, and we let the reaction happen for a certain time. And after that time, we take it out, and we know we got the the desired thickness of oxide grown on silicon. So, and then we put copper as well. So this is this shows a, a magnified image of of a multi-layered device. So it has six layers. So we are not just talking about single layer of devices like I would do for industry. Is that many more layers? This is from '97 where they were making six level dice. There was devices on every level. This is 130 nanometer product, which shows a process called Damacy. We'll look at that. So the idea is that these are all layers of devices, and then there are wires which are running horizontal. And there are wires which are running vertical. On the same die, they got six layers. Yeah. These are old devices. Now we have many more layers. But we'll, we'll get into that also. How do we interconnect different layers? Right? But we will not be making these. We will be making a single layer in the, in the lab. You guys, all of you have heard Moore's Law. Right? Anybody who has never heard Moore's Law? The word Moore's Law. Okay. So, Generally, it's, it's used in many different shapes, but the exact words were that it was a forecast for 10 years that there will be 65,000 components in a single silicon chip, which roughly translates to doubling after every 18 months. So this is the growth, and now we are somewhere where we have millions of devices on or on a surf, on a substrate, <coughs> there is something would be used to define the, the, the what kind of technology we are using. When I say technology, translates to it's you it's depicted in terms of nanometers. So, 45 nanometer technology, 65 nanometer, or 22 nanometer. When somebody says we are at 22 nanometer node, the node, but it means that the industry or, or the production is is has the capability of producing 22 nanometer channel. The channel is something which defines how far our source and drain. So I wanted to touch this. Well, keep on discussing this as we go along, but wanted to share. So this is a final FET product, MOSFET product. So essentially it has a few basic parts. There's, there's source, of course, so it's written there. It's so we have source, we have drain, and we have gate, and this part is where the channel is formed. So the length of this guy is what is the, the considered to define the channel, the, the node. So what, how long is the channel that is being used? And why is this parameter important? Because we can scale everything down. Ultimately, it's this channel that's going to result into the gating effect. What was gating effect? Gating is just like a gate. What does a gate do? What does a door do? Let things pass. Let people pass or well, stop them, right? So what does gate do here? Controls the channel. Controls the channel. And what does gate do? When, it, when you say control the channel, what happens by controlling the channel? Blocks the current. Blocks the transport of charge. Right? So we can control the 
charge flow from source to drain by controlling the bias on the gate. So here, whatever voltage we provide. Okay, now look at this device and tell me what kind of voltage do we have to apply on gate to create the channel? What kind of bias do we have to apply on the gate to create the channel? Positive. So that will result into what's going to happen in this area when we apply positive voltage? Say it again. N channel will be formed. So, so negative charge carriers will accumulate in that region because of attraction of positive charge. They are spread around, so they will accumulate. But it's a P type device. So those charge carriers, which is electron in this case, are they minority carriers or majority carriers? It's, but the it's substrate is the bulk is P-type, right? So there are no articles. There are few. There's a, it's a P-type material, which means there are much more holes available, but there are electrons available. So we attract those few electrons, in this case electrons, to come close to that surface. It's a cross-sectional view of the device, but it's actually a three-dimensional device, right? So it's a square plate where we are applying the Eight voltage. They are accumulating all the charges to come together. Once they come together, they create a train of charge. So we can now have charge transfer from source to drain. So, but to get there, we have to have all these materials come together: silicon dioxide, beta, P plus material, aluminum, oxide. Right. So our goal is not to study device physics, but to see how do we make this whole gigantic substrate for the device structure and all these parts. So I'll expose some ignorance by asking this question, but is this, this what... This was we'll all unnecessary. <laughs> okay. uh, is What's this question? what you would call an NPN transistor? Are those a different kind of device altogether? Yeah. Right? It, it is an NPN... It's, yeah, MOSFETs are N-MOSFET or B-MOSFET. I see. So NPN is a, is two diodes back to back. So, but essentially, you have to have a gate to get the transistor effect out of that. Yeah, that's how well, functionally they, in the blocks or, or with high level um, device point of view. Yeah, that's how we depict it. But actually, this is what physically we make it. This is how we make. It. So we have to now see all these steps. How do we make the semiconductor material P type? How do we make some parts to be P plus, which means it's much more doped to be P type in this region? But how do we control just it happens to certain depth? How do we make this N type material within that well? How do we make how do we make this specific shape of aluminum? What is this thin oxide? This is all what we have to, what we are aiming to learn and, and to do it, to do some part of it. So this is something which is using hefnium-based high-k metal gate transistor. When you say gate transistor, which means they are using, instead of silicon dioxide here, they are using some other material which has high-k is called dielectric constraint, that's high dielectric constraint. And we'll see reasons why we want to do that. Right? Any questions on this simple transistor diagram? Right. So this, these are real pictures, real cross sections where we have 35 nanometer memory device. It's the channel size that defines how wide is that device and that defines the node. And again, this is 45 nanometer node device. So you have source drain and you have high K gate insulator instead of silicon. And there 
that's that's where we get the getting effect. This shows that how small can we make the oxide? We can go down to a few nanometers, which is two to three atom thick layer of oxide. The channel length that you talk about, the 45 nanometer, is it the effective channel length or the actual channel length? Yeah, so there's a there's a formula how do we get from actual to the node length. But so this refers to the effective channel. To the effective channel length. Yes. So and by effective we'll see because there are many things we have to do to the issues when we make channel too short, they are called short channel effects. Specific them. So we have to do some things to get rid of the short channel effects, which results into the physical length to be different than the length that we, we use to call it a node. Right? So uh, this is to show that when you say uniformity of oxide thickness, so this is the a few atom thick oxide, and it has to be precisely that. It has to be uniformly that thickness all over the device. This is just one transistor, and we have billions of transistors in one die, right? One chip. And then on a wafer, we have again thousands of those dies. And what's a wafer? Probably should bring it next time. So wafer is a thing in labs, so what you will be using will be a two inch wafer. So we say circular disk of silicon, which is two inch in, in diameter. We use four inch wafers also. Industry uses eight inch wafers, 12 inch wafers, and now they're using 16 inch wafer. So it's a big plate of silicon, 500 micron thick, and we, we, we have to make devices all over it. So that's the kind of uniformity we need over the whole substrate, a few nanometers. So what defines the node? There is a Consortium called ITRS, which is uh, companies, industry, academia, so the different partners to this who define the roadmap. And the, the association called SIS, Semiconductor Industry, Industrial Alliance, or something. So they define for next few years. I think they go to 10 years advance and they define where we should be. They, if you look at this website, I have some plots here from their website. So they define where the industry should be. Some of those projections are, are very, very well, like advanced or far ahead of current technology. But we, they, since they define their milestones, so, so industry pushes to get there. And so far, they've been catching up. And, and the goal is always to make devices smaller, faster, and cheaper chips. Now, we are pushing this device size down, which essentially results into higher density of devices, right? So we can cram many more devices in that same size as 10 years. But there's a this trade-off. What is the biggest trade-off of pushing too many devices in? In a small space, heat. heat right? That's with heat translates into how much power uh, uh, motherboard, so to speak, consumes, and how fast can we transfer that heat away? Right? Failure. There's much more failure. So instead of pushing in consumer electronics, pushing device sizes further down, we have found another way. That is using multiple cores, right? No quad core, right? So multiple cores, so we, instead of making one processor much faster, much smaller, we can put many in parallel to each other. And, and we'll see specific reasons for that. As we get through there, why that uh, trade-off, that pushing one device to be and smaller and faster, we can use multiple groups. So what are the main types of devices that we use? Memory processors, 
commodity integrated circuits system on chip. The no memories and microprocessors, right? What are examples of commodity ICs and complex system on chips? We don't see them too often because most of those are for specialized users, military grade, for example, or, or used for what you call the PLGs, which are dedicated for carry out certain functions in industry. So we don't see them in consumer electronics. So they are also major focus of the industry. So, so there's they keep on updating their the roadmap, and which which brings tables and collections from the previous one, and the, the previous year which brings the latest information from the whole industry. These are some of the numbers from so some of the uh, what you call metrics for different parts they have from so last year. So they have test equipment, RF devices, which is used in, in wireless, merging devices, numbers on lithography, interconnect integration. So these are all different parts of the industry that and as a process engineer, we, we may focus on one part of it. If I'm a lithography specialist, I will be, I have to know what are the issues with lithography. But ITRS puts up all those information out there. And again, this is from two years ago. I think they have a new one out there. So it just shows that the growth of industry sites, it has an upward trend throughout the years, billions of dollars. It breaks out into different components. Many of the, the industry, uh, much of the industry is, <coughs> is focused on, on specialized uses. So major chunk of this revenue comes from, from military or for outer space applications which we don't see in the consumer technology. All right, so what do we do? What all will we be covering to see the, the whole processing of fabrication? We'll be probably not doing bonding, but everything else is, is what you're going to do. So pattern transfer, again, so as a as a VLSI engineer, so you guys have to know that VLSI designers are distinctly separate from the fabrication engineer, right? So VLSI is, is the art of placing down as many devices as you can, right? And testing them on computer and seeing that they would do exactly what the whole chip is supposed to do. But then that needs to be translated into a physical design where I have capacitance, capacitors in the circuit, I have resistances, I have diodes, inverters, all those things. And that results into a, a functional map on a polarizer, which may have multiple layers multiple levels. Now, that's the same example that even if I just have to make a, a resistance, I may have to do doping into substrate for certain length and for certain width. So if I look at from, from top, I would have this region which is heavily doped. And I can make connection. <coughs> so I can cover everything up and I can make connection from here to from here. So if I look at from top, I have this region which is open. And I can make medical <coughs> connections with this guy. Right? So this would be a simple resistance. Why do we want to do it? 
in the substrate itself, why not use an external resistance? Can I use external resistance? Size. How are you going to bond the million resistors? Million resistors. So that's the, the basic idea of integrated circuit. Everything has to be integrated. Everything has to be within the bulk, right next to each other. So this is something that gets translated from design of circuit into physical depiction how it should be. What do we do? We make a thing called mask set. Masks are transparent slides or plates on which we make these design. Some parts of it are opaque, some of it just are transparent. We use that to transfer our design into our wafer. How do we do that? We coat this wafer with a with a thin layer of a material, which is called photoresist. It's it's a liquid material. We coat the surface, we heat up the wafer, the liquid solidifies. So now we have this thin layer of material called photoresist. Why we call it photoresist? Because if we expose it to certain wavelength of light it undergoes chemical changes, which makes it soluble at those parts, or insoluble, depending on what time. So simple analogy, an old analogy is that the reel on those old-fashioned cameras, what we used to call, if you pull that, if you open that reel, we used to say it has part here, but it was essentially, it was exposed to it. I guess old enough to remember those reads from those cameras we used, right? What was speed of those reads? 100 to 1600. Yeah, so they, were, to 1600. so they were like 100. What other speeds they were used to come up? 100, 200, 400, 800. 400, 800, 1600. Right. And they had to, if you, if you, Remember that the, the camera was an isolated part, right? There was the only access of light in that camera was through, what do we call it? Front thing, shutter. Aperture. Aperture is, no how, yeah, aperture. So we had that shutter which was a door to that negative, right? So what did we have to do before we take that out? We had to roll it into another small dark room, which was that case of the, the negative, right? And then they would process it into a specialized chamber where it would come out, undergo chemical treatment. And once it was treated with chemical, now the pattern was transferred onto the plastic sheet, right? So does it make sense? So that pattern was exposed when we would take the picture, but it was not yet transferred. It was transferred to only the coating, which was on that plastic sheet. And once we do chemical treatment, that pattern was transferred into the plastic. And then that plastic, what we used to call negative, use it to do the same process, but now on a piece of paper. So that paper had that coating, which was light sensitive, and we would, they would, I don't know if you know that, but they still show in movies where they have this dark room, which is, which has light, red light in there, and somebody is, is washing that sheet of paper, and suddenly the, the image comes out, right? So now, if it is dark room, why do we have a dark red light in there? Because that coating is insensitive to that wavelength, but it's sensitive to other wavelengths. So that that paper is also something which is placed on a, somewhere, and negative was put in, and and that coating was exposed to that light which comes through that entity. 
exactly same process, same idea here, that we have this mask set made by a VLSI designer who has placed all the devices where they're supposed to go, and he has placed different layers of devices on different masks, because in one case, I might have to make just the, the depth, just do this, what do you call it? Doping to make it electrically active. In another mask set, I will have to open these windows for electrical connection with the outside world. In another mask, I will then have to make this metal deposition. So define patterns where metal should go, right? So that mask set is, so when I say set, it's not just one of those, there are multiple of those, but we use them to transfer the pattern onto a photosensitive material which we have coated on a wafer. We expose it with UV light, specific wavelength, very, very precise wavelength, and we wash this coating in certain chemical called developer, interestingly, because that's exactly what it is doing, developing. So it removes that coating from exposed area or unexposed area, depending on whatever combination we use. But in any case, we will get the pattern transferred. Now, let me ask something. If I have this multiple mass, what is a major requirement for their alignment? So, think about that. I, in, in one mask, I make a line, right, and I dope it. Now, I have to put and then I cover everything with oxide. Now I have to open connection windows at the edges of that line. So what can you say about alignment for the second mask? Should it be exactly where the first line was? Of course, I mean, yes. Right, does it make sense? Okay, stop me if it doesn't, because this is something we don't see every day, right? Once, if you understand this well, then rest will be. So, think about it. When I have a, when I have to fix something into, and I have a bolt and I have a nut, they have to align to go in, right? So now, if this was the surface, and I made a, I, I did lithography and I exposed, I just did doping and I defined a resistor within the bulb. Now, in next layer, I have to make connections. I have to get the lead out from edges, right? I don't want it to come from center. I don't want one lead to come from here, another from here, because that's not going to connect my resistor. So I have these two leads we exactly coming from this place. So next mask, which is going to define the placement from a lead, has to be aligned very well with the first layer. So I used one mask to do this. That mask goes away. I do something and I put oxide and now I use the second mask, but it has to be, now the mask is gone, but its pattern is there. So the second mask has to align with the pattern, so my leaves can come out exactly from those two places. Does it make sense? So pattern transfer is a, is, is a very in-depth thing, so we use lithography to do that. So lithography is Optical lithography is where we use light, ultraviolet light, to transfer the pattern on the surface. Once we do that, we can, we may be doing implantation, put those, what do you call it, dopants. We might be doing etching to remove material from certain places. We may be doing deposition, putting material everywhere and then maybe doing another lithography to define the pattern. It might be cleaning. Cleaning is very important because our devices are so small, they're even smaller than specks of dust. So if you have a dust particle land on your wafer and you keep on processing, we'll lose many of the devices, which is a matter of yield, right? If I don't get high yield of devices, they're going to fire me. Right. So we need to keep it clean. 
while we do all that, we have to keep on looking how a process is occurring. It's called metrology. Metrology is looking at a process, maybe in situ. What is in situ? Have you guys ever heard in situ? In place. What does in situ mean? I remember it by in situation, during situation. So measuring it while it's happening. What does in situ mean? Measuring it while the process is happening. Right? How do we, give me example, where do we see a process while it's happening? Most macroscopic things we see while they're happening. We see macros everywhere. We, when we do a process, we want to get a feedback. Maybe it's a visual feedback. We want to see how things are progressing. Right? Don't tell me yes, haven't done any chemistry yeah. reactions. So litmus paper is used for that, for that matter, right? So we keep on checking the pH. We get to pH also. We have lots of chemistry. So we do check. And what does pH tell us? Oh, this is a core basic or something, yes. So how is it? So if we start with highly basic material and we expect it to neutralize and we still see base, basic tendency, what does it tell us? It's not done yet, right? Or many, many possibilities. So we have to do metrology, maybe in situ, or maybe end of the process. If it's a, so for in situ metrology, our sensing has to withstand whatever process parameters. Heat, if we do a process, maybe 1000 degrees centigrade, there are not many options available for in situ measurement, right? But there are, we can do something where we can maybe throw a laser and see reflection that can tell us how things are happening. And we'll see what can be properties of laser that can change and tell us something. But metrology is very important, maybe in situ, maybe after. What would it directly impact? If we are not careful with the metrology, what would it directly impact? If I'm not careful in measuring the process outcomes, what happens to the whole batch of devices? They may all be ruined, right? They may be ruined. What does that mean for the the owner of the company? Bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. So we're not getting yield. The keyword yield. And I'm not cutting cost. I'm increasing cost. That is, that's not what business are for. Business are paid. So what's a typical yield? I mean, how? Uh, I've always thought, you know, you make something and it's made. I mean, how, what percentage do you actually lose? What's acceptable in this? So yield, okay. Now this is a very, uh, very what do you call it? Uh, closer or very narrow look we are taking. Yield includes many things, not just process yield, but the device, what you call mean time to failure yield, how long it it can work, right? So there, we'll, we'll get to yield, but when you get to statistical process control, the later part, we'll, we'll look at that. What defines uh, the yield of, of a whole process? So, and, and how do we control that? How do we mitigate the failure? That's a whole different Right? Thermal process, of course, we know one thermal process so far. What is that? Oxidation. Oxidation, right? Then at high temperature, we'll see other thermal processes as you can. So this is essentially a breakdown of what we're going to see. And more precisely, these are the technical terms, terminologies. And as we progress, these terminologies will become easy because there's specific meanings of certain things, and that's my my goal to make you comfortable with those. So, photolithography, transfer of design using optical wavelengths, right within that range. If you go above or below, it becomes different type of lithography. Oxidation, 
we do mostly by thermal process. Implantation or diffusion? Do I have diffusion? Yeah, diffusion are done to introduce impurities. Right? Impurities for semiconductors are good if we know what we are using as impurity. Right? We deposit material by PVD or CVD. It'll become easier as we go along. So you'll remember what is PVD or CVD. For me, it's, yeah, once you do it too long, you just consider it's, you know, we'll, we'll look at those closely. And then we remove some material, maybe the material which was already there, or maybe material that we have introduced, call it, so we call it etching. And then we'll see that we have to polish before going to the next level. We have to get a clean slate before we get to the next level of devices. So we do that by CMB. There are non-CMB methods also. So essentially, summing it up, we start with the, we grow crystal. Do we see crystal in nature? Single crystalline materials, do we see them in nature? All over the place. All over the place? Okay, give me a few examples. Salt, diamond. Salt. Emerald. Sand. Sand. Oh. So you guess, uh, partially wrong, or partially right. Glass is half full. So, yes, salt, sodium chloride is a crystal, but is it single crystalline material? It depends on how big a crystal you have, right? Right. So, it depends on, on how big, maybe not, but each grain is probably crystalline. You can get salt crystals about that big, they're rare. So each. So, uh, the other thing was diamond. Diamond is a, is a, is a very fine example of a single crystal material. But it occurs in nature, and we call it single crystal material, it is expensive. So, not many materials exist single in single crystal form in nature. If they do, they are rare, they are very expensive. So we have to make them. So sand has silica. Silicon we have to purify. After purifying, we have to. It can still, if we solidify, it might result into what is called poly crystalline material, which has many many crystalline substructures, but not a single crystalline material. A single crystalline material is something that has what is basic requirement for it crystalline material. Single crystalline material. Think about it. Structure repeats infinitely, right? Or to whatever size, whatever we are concerned with. If it doesn't, it means there is a defect. So electrically, that would have implications. So silicon, what we use is single crystal silicon for for device components. But we do use. Uh, uh, polycrystalline silicon as well. So we get this big cylinder of single crystalline silica and we chop it off. Or we it. We'll look at how it is done. So what's more common, polycrystalline or single crystalline? And what do we want to use? Common where? Industry or with what we're using? Depends on where it works you, but yeah, so polysilicon I can deposit in lab. I cannot make single crystalline silica. That requires a whole, well, it's a, it requires a foundry where you can melt silica, and then make, well, we'll see how do we make ingot. It's called an ingot. So you, you, you have to have a pure seed of single crystalline material and you grow single crystalline silica out of that. Are the wafers single, single crystalline? Yeah. yeah. That's the whole idea. So, we get that wafer, which is a plate, 500 micron thick, and depends on what so thickness and and the what you call size. They all come custom made. So generally, four inch wafer we get for well, for twenty dollar piece is 500 micron thick. And to give a perspective, how big is 500 micron? Half a millimeter. Half a millimeter. 
Yeah, so technically yes, but I want to give a relation with something which you can see. So a single human hair is 50 to 100 micron. Right, so it's very thin, very fragile. And since it's single crystalline, it's brittle. So if you pressure it somewhere just slightly, it's going to break into billion pieces. That's exaggeration. If you, if you generally it breaks into certain number of pieces. So if you put it right in the middle, it's going to break into four exact same triangles, sort of triangles. But so it's brittle. So we have that wafer, and then we do everything in the bulk or on top of the wafer. So, so just so before we do any process, first we have to define the areas where we have to do that process. So what we do is that use that mass set to do lithography. Just to get some idea, how much is a modern mask set cost for, for one type of, for one technology? What do you guess mask set would cost? This is a question which is not confined to you. Everybody has to give another one. You mean for a whole device, like an Mass chip or something? Whole device, yes. So this is a bunch of <coughs> things, glass plates, right? But before you get it, people have to <coughs> place the devices and translate into this. How much do you think would a mass set cost? With all the design, of course, you don't have to send it back to, to get the other design. So final mask set ready to go into production, how much would that cost? Give me another throw at the point. Millions. Ten millions? Billions. Billions? <laughs> all right. Anybody else? Millions? <laughs> it's about three to five million. So, but that's it, that device. But it has to be come before it gets to the last stage. Rigorous testing that has to be done. Now, is that the cost of making the physical mask, or is that the cost of design plus Making the physical, the physical mask is a very simple process. E-beam writing will do the writing. Okay, so this is like how much man uh, hours so Yes, and there are, there are a bunch of VLSA designers sitting, and they have to yeah. cram all those devices, and they have to define where interconnect is coming, where a VI is coming, which is vertical, and where a, a, a connection is going, which is horizontal. And so all that. So straight capacitances and spacing between the so whole lot of I can't even enumerate because that's a whole speciality how to do that. Uh, so the mass set uh, when they design the thing, do they even include the parasitics of the packaging or that comes yes, later? Yeah, that all is part of the mass set, the mass design. Right? So but then once now they have to know the the constraints of the fabrication also. So they have to know how small can how small of lithography can be done, reproducibly, with high with reasonable yield. So they have to know that, do that design. So it's a big team that comes up with that. So how many masks do you end up with? Like for for an Intel modern processor, what's the order of magnitude? I think that we have it somewhere. I think that close to thirty masks. The close to thirty lithographies that have to be done. I have it somewhere, I think. So it has to, one, before we get the whole, it has to go undergo like about 30 of those. So in every lithography requires the previous, okay. So the design of the process, which is called, uh, it was there, on how do we <coughs> integrate the whole process, has to be optimized. If I put a simple example, if I put a metal on the wafer, I put metal already to make maybe interconnect. Now, can I do a thousand degrees centigrade oxidation? Think about it. No, because metal is vaporized, right? So, it has to be 
the, the whole process has to be optimized, streamlined to know which can come after what. Right? But yes, if I have metal, I can do PECVD, plasma enhanced CVD to deposit oxide. <coughs> I cannot grow oxide then, but I can deposit oxide. Do they usually end up doing several iterations of these, or is it a design and manufacturing <coughs> that you're fine? No, I think that's uh, the whole process. That, that cost goes into all that iteration as well. But was in the software world, you know, we iterate uh, ad nauseum until we get to something usable. Is it like that in uh, mass design, uh, IC design, or is it I think more? There, there are many things which are very well known. For example, temperature, what's the budget, thermal budget. After end of the process, what is the thermal budget of that batch? Which would tell us how much high we can take it into temperature. So there are many basic things which are already known. So. Yes, for the next generation devices, they are already testing things, breaking things, looking at things, how do they come out. Even after modeling, we have to do it. Yes, you're right. There are several iterations going on into subcomponents, not the whole process. Yeah. So there are people who are coming up with different maybe lithography techniques. So they can be phased into the, the main mask design. Process. So the recipe is generally just work. Rep once, once they're known. Okay, once the parameters are nailed down, those are established recipes. Then we don't touch them. We just do them, right? But there's, there's an interesting side note to it that whenever, if I'm a process engineer, I know how all of these things are happening. But when I go into a fab, I have to know my machine, which means I have to run several characterization runs to know the behavior of machine. So I have to do it myself to see, okay, the paper says for 10 minute oxidation, I should get this amount of oxide, right? Okay, now I'll do it myself and see how, what do I get? So I have to characterize the equipment myself, the process before you do it on, uh, on master wafer or master batch, right? So all those steps have to be characterized. So it says, so once you do lithography, then we, we might be doing doping, we might be doing etching, we might be doing whatever. So after we do one step, we keep, we keep on going to next. So until we do all the, all the masks and, and we are done, and then we go to the next level where we have the whole wafer ready. Now we dice it. Dicing is cutting it into small pieces, making dyes out of the whole. Thing. And then goes into packaging. Packaging is something which we will not do. We will look at some aspects which may be important for front end integration, but we will not go into the details of packaging. Right? So, something which you will hear from me alternative. So, I may call it wafer or dye, but I would essentially mean a substrate. Substrate another word of same thing that something that we are using to build up things up. So wafer or slice is single crystal, a block, very thin plate chopped off of this big cylindrical ingot. It's called wafer. Unit process or module is single processing step. So oxidation is a module. Or oxidation is a is a unit process, right? So you hear these interchangeable. Module, separate unit processes stuck together build a structure. Now shallow trench, uh, so we'll, we'll see all these things uh, closely, but when I say shallow trench, it, it entails oxidation, and then lithography, then etching of oxide, etching of silicon, then filling with silicon dioxide. So just trenching would essentially mean that a bunch of processes that go into making that. That will be another goal that you guys will be comfortable in knowing many of these modules. When I say VR, you would be readily clear how what are steps that may go into making a VR. So 
So we'll, we'll go through. We'll do this practice over and over with many things. Polygate, again, is using a polycrystalline material to act as an electrode. Heavily doped silicon, polysilicon is used as a metal, almost like a metal. So use it for gating. Spacer, again, putting some object. So many things which we'll see, they, they essentially are composed of a number of steps that go into them. Device is an electrically active component. So a bunch of things come together and make a device. So that should, if you remember those electronics, block diagrams really had this, we show this diode and we show this resistance and we show, okay, this is input and this is output. This is amplifying or, or unit output. Remember those? So we have those bunch of components. That's a device. Right? So in that case, what we show is a, maybe we do it on breadboard and we measure the output and input. Here we are making it all into substrate. That's why it's integrated. So that bunch of things is called a device. So when I say MOSFET or transistor, I'm talking about a device. Not just this source train and gate but associated resistances. But generally we just take that source train and that, that picture which I showed. So device also will be used in many levels. Circuit, the devices they come together, build a circuit die is a single standalone piece that comes out at the end from that whole wafer and process flow is the sequence of steps. So if you don't quite get what I mean by circuit terminology in certain context, ask so that you can, you can go over what are other ways how you can define the same thing. Right? So, Dr. I have a question. Uh, when you use ICs, you usually end up putting capacitors and resistors, etc., around them. Is that because you want some form of external control, or is that because some resistors and capacitors are just too difficult to build into devices? Well, they're probably not too difficult, but to be flexibility, we don't put them on the, on the IC itself. So that same IC can be now used for, I see. for flexible ranges of resistances. So you don't want to hard code it, so to speak, right? So same thing what we do in software, we don't, many things we don't want to hard code, we want to leave it for the user. Same is the case for that, so, right? Make sense? Make sense. Right. So, we'll, so this is what all goes into the mask design. Right. For our case, we will not go into what are all things that go with, but we'll see. We we'll start from wafer fabrication. <coughs> so, but in design, we have an architecture logic that comes together and makes a make a plan, right, where we want to verify output of a, of a circuit, of a device and then of a, the whole circuit. And what those VLSI designers do, a bunch of things, schematics, vectors, design, and then they define a layout. So, and that layout is then verified. So when they do that layout, then they have to know all the constraints or limitations of fabrication, lithography and, and oxidation and, and etching. So all those things need to be known at this part. So when those are verified, they define the layout, how practically it should look like, how where should be maybe a resistance relative to a transistor, which should be a source, a drain, gate, all that. So once that is verified, they result into what you call mask or reticle. Same thing, slight difference between mask and reticle. We'll look at that, what is a reticle, what is a mask. But we generally call these things mask. So this mask is a physical representation of this layout, which was on the computer screen. So now they have made something which physically is transferred to a, a transparent plate, parts plate. And that is what we 
take to transfer design onto the wafer. So we wafer fabrication is the circle is flat circle is essentially what we'll be spending the next 16 weeks on. And then once you get it, then we, we test, we characterize it, goes into packaging. So what happens in that red circle? You get that wafer. So the, this guy shows molten silicon. And we'll look at this guy also, how it is done. Molten silicon. And this is what we call a seed. This thin thing is called a seed. So I have this fine, thin, pen-like structure, which is crystalline, single crystalline. And I dip it into a molten cubic it's called, generally we call it crucibles. Crucible is a, is a dish, which is a high temperature. It's filled with molten pure silicon. I dip it <coughs> and I draw it back. Once I draw it, silicon atoms, they're going to get cold, they're going to get solidified. But during this process, they're going to follow the pattern of this crystal of my seed. Right? Once I draw it out, I draw a big cylinder with it. The size of cylinder depends on how fast I might draw. Right? But that, what you call ingot, the cylinder of silicon is now single crystalline, following the structure of my seed. So once you get that out, it's a cylinder, we polish it, we, we bring it to the size, cut it from a side, we, we, we put sort of a, 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 a scratch, we put, we flatten out some part of it. That thing is called a flat, you know, what we call it as a term. That flat tells us the orientation of Hang up, stay here with me. Don't get too worried about orientation. We'll talk about orientation. For a crystal, if it's a pure cube, we have an atom at every edge of that crystal cell. Right? So look at if you think about it. If I have This is essentially my def our definition of crystal, right? So this repeats on all sides. And there's a repetition of this structure in all directions. So this one guy is called a cell, unit cell, right? So depending on that, we, we create what we call flags. It tells you the orientation of, the, of silica. I will see why is that important, but for now just focus on, we, we make those wafers, we oxid, we put them in furnace, we oxidize them, we, we may incorporate impurities of course, semiconductor has to be doped to become electrically active, and we then use mass to pattern, we may etch, we may deposit, we do the whole process few times, and then we end up with this wafer which has distinct number of dies, and then we test the devices of those dies. Right? Make sense? And then from there it goes into, we, we break each one out, and can be, we dice it like this, so each square rectangle has number of dies, which go into this die, as we saw in the bigger one, those black things, Make connections, we package it, and it's ready to ship out. Right. So this is showing this dicing saw. The wafer is here, and this is a blade which has diamond coating at the tip. Moves at really thousands of RPMs, cuts through silica. It's called dicing saw. Right. So this thing goes now into a circuit board. Right? So if you look at, uh, if you open up a microprocessor, 
to find something like this where some just very small part of the whole package is where the actual silicon is, resters or connections and heat sinks. Right? So now, in this one of this, there may be many, many, many devices, so source gate, bipolar transistor. Right? Any questions? Let's probably stop here. I wanted to get into semiconductor materials. Other is a GPA. So he'll be the leader of the labs and most of the outside of the class issues, homeworks and assignments and everything. So he's also part of our blackboard. He can access him through there. I had his email address on slides last week, last, on Tuesday. So We'll be posting his office hours also, where you can see him in Narrowfab Annex. We just give you guys questions. Is it time? This record shows me shows me two thirty five. Shows me two thirty five. One forty eight. One forty eight. Okay. Questions. So when they cut that uh, flat. That's just a marker, right? That doesn't have anything to do with the real orientation. No. no, that has to do with the real orientation, but that doesn't have to do with the actual orientation. Yeah, that's, that's, just just a, that's just something that, that's just like, for like the resistor colors. You know, we like have big eyes. We, we can't see the, the, the lattice uh, orientation. So it's just for you and me. So we can, from the size of the wafer and, and the wafer cut. So there are one or two cuts. One is called a major flat. The other one, if it is there, it's called a minor flat. It's smaller in size. That tells me what is the doping, what kind of doping has been done on this wafer, and what is the crystalline orientation. It's important to know crystalline orientation because if you look, we'll, I will go through this, that there are different number of atoms available in different planes. So if I look at this plane at the top or the bottom, yes, the same number of atoms. But if I look at this plane, which makes this guy, I have different density of atoms in this plane. Make sense? So I need to know crystal orientation of my Because that will translate into, into parameters of reactions for oxidation, diffusion, everything that comes that we need to do on this. Right? I'll see you on Tuesday. This will stay up there, I think, till the end of the month. If not, I can get you later on oh, okay, okay. the links to that. Yeah, yeah, we take a backup on. And and every slide is uh, posted up for the class, right? Of course, yeah, yeah, because I do on right on slides. Uh, so we have always debated, but this is probably the best. On that very yes. good question. I may have to miss the 
um, class either uh, right before or right after the not the class the lab spring break uh, is there any way of making up such things or is that not yeah, I'm taking care of the labs okay so is it, is it possible to make up a lab or work ahead of, ahead of time or something actually it depends if we have two labs yeah. see lab issues okay work out with it because sure. he would know if he can fix you with some other yeah. other group or so it depends that actually what we are talking about. Sometimes what happens is that uh, like um, oxidation. So in oxidation it takes three layers to complete one process. I see. So even if you you know the process and you miss one layer, I can combine it because we process all the vapors together oh, at see. one time. I see. So, so it on what we'll doing be, at the time. you just need the readings next time. But sometimes it like if you if it's diffusion. So in that case, you need to be there. So it depends on what exact week you're talking about. Is it possible to come do the process independently beforehand? Mm, no, because you cannot do anything independently. You I need to be there. What's that? You want to step outside? Sure, sure.